Good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning. This is our Sunday school lesson for Poplar Springs Baptist Church for on June the 13th, 2021. Today's title of our lesson is Gideon Destroys Baal's Altar. It comes out of Judges 6, verses 25 through um, 32. In this week's lesson, we find that um, God's preparing Gideon for his call to deliver the Israelites from the Midianites. Okay, his first step would be to teach Gideon obedience. That's a much needed lesson for all of us today is obedience. You know, the Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. So Gideon, he's going to have to just demonstrate his obedience by tearing down the altar of Baal. So Gideon, he was meek. He was humble. He was probably a person, no doubt, just like you and I would be just, just a regular person. I'm not noted as, as probably any kind of a leader, much less a military leader at that point. But he was just a regular guy, you know. And that, that's the kind of people that the Lord likes to use. He just likes to use, you know, regular people that what a lot of people think are unable. The Lord uses those people to bring honor and glory to his name. That way God gets all the honor. God gets all the glory. Not for mankind. He don't use people that are high-minded, that are full of fame and glory. He uses people that are meek and humble, people just like you and I. So today we're going to see how he uses Gideon, how he prepares him. And um, and that just should be a reminder to all of us that, that God can use any of us. We all have different talents, different traits, different different things that God can use for his honor and his glory if we'll just be obedient. That's the key to be obedient. Be obedient to the Lord's call, to be obedient to the Lord's cause, and just to be obedient to be his servant. So um, we see today that, um, you know, Gideon, like I said, he was not, he was not famous. He was not high minded. And um, like, like many of us, you know, we're, we're nobody as far as the world standards that they don't even have a clue who we are, but there is one who knows who we are. He knows exactly where we are. And he knows what we have need of. And that is the Lord God. That is Jesus Christ, our Lord and savior. And just as he looked down on Gideon, he saw much more in Gideon than even Gideon saw in himself. So God knows how to nurture us. He knows how to grow us. He knows how to make us. He knows how to mold us, to shape us. He knows how to use us in a way to be able to take a stand for him, not just a stand, but sometimes you have to take a bold stand. That's what Gideon was required to do. He had to take a bold stand for Christ. And then, and we see that that's what God did for Gideon. He gave him that courage. He nurtured him along. He put his hand upon him. And he led him in all the steps that he needed to take to get into the place to where God could use him greatly and mightily. And so I'm hoping in today's lesson that maybe maybe we'll be convicted and encouraged to take a bold stand for Christ. I know I need that in my own heart, in my life. I need more of encouragement to take a bolder stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe not when it's just convenient. That's not really taking a bold stand. Taking a bold stand is when it's not convenient. When, this, when the situation and circumstances are all against you, as it was in Gideon's day, we'll see, that's when you need to take a bold stand. So in um, today's lesson, we're going to see that our, our golden text actually comes from Deuteronomy. It's not out of Judges, but the golden text. It says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. That's from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7 and verse number 6. We see God has chosen his children to be a special people. The Bible says we're to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And um, a little background information leading us up to where we're going to be starting in today's lesson is um, after entering into the land of Canaan under Joshua's leadership, the Israelites, they served, they served God during the days of Joshua. They served God... <clears throat> Even after Joshua had died and moved on, even when the elders were still still in charge, the people still served God during those days. But it wasn't long after that, after Joshua died, after those elders died, that the Israelites, they departed from serving the Lord. They're always looking on the other side of the fence. They're always looking to what the world has to offer. They're always wanting to get their feet and their teeth sunk in to what the world has to offer. And no doubt that's dangerous grounds whenever we get to looking that way. But like I said, after that, they, they started serving false gods. 
In other words, I think the biggest reason is they serve themselves. Bottom line, they serve themselves. They serve the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Those are always the three key elements that the devil uses to get us all focused, to get us looking yonder's way toward, toward the world. So um, so that's what they were doing. They were serving themselves. They want, they want to do what they want to do rather than serving Jehovah God. So um, judgment quickly followed after that. After they after they departed from serving the Lord, then judgment quickly followed. The Lord put judgment on them. They were oppressed from two different nations, one for eight years, one for 18 years. So for 26 years, they, 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 they were oppressed. I think Moab was the last, last, last one right there, the latter one. But after 26 years of oppression, the people, they started crying back out to God. They cried out to God for help. And the Lord, he brought deliverance. He raised up two judges during that time that would deliver them. He raised up Athenial and Ehud to rescue, to rescue them. So um, then after that, he raised up Shamgar, another judge, to deliver Israel from the Philistines. But during this sequence, what we all know, we that read the Bible, we know that they continue to fall back, to fall back. Every time God would deliver them, they would go back to their evil, wicked ways. So they always return to those evil, wicked ways. So the Lord, he finally, he sold them. He sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan. He sold the people to them. So then again, the people, they start crying out to God once they're in slavery, once they're oppressed, once, once these rulers are beating down on them and, and putting a heavy hand upon them, then they start crying back out to God. That seems like that's, that, that's, that's so sad, but, but many of us are that way today. You know, while everything's nice and smooth sailing, well, we just want to have our own way. We want to do what we want to do. But boy, when circumstances get tough, or maybe the finances, when there's not enough money to pay the bills, maybe maybe when things get looking grim and dim, well, then, then we've got time to cry out to God, don't we? We should have a constant relationship with the Lord at all times. It should be consistent. It should be day by day. As thy days, so shall thy strength be, that strength to serve the Lord. So we should walk with him. We should read his word. We should pray. We should study. That should be a daily. That should be a daily, a daily course of action, not just when circumstances are extreme. But anyway, the Lord, he, the Lord sold them. They cried out for help. Then he raises up Deborah. He raises up Barak to defeat the Canaanites. So he is, once again, he's delivered them. He's delivered them out of bondage. So after that, they experienced 40 years of peace. And it was smooth sailing for a while, but no doubt they begin to regress. There was a lapse back in their evil ways. The Lord once again chastises people through the Midianites and through their allies. And for seven years, these Midianites and their allies, they would come in and they would raid the Israelites. They would raid their harvest, their land, their crops. For seven years, they did this. And no doubt that left the Israelites in a very poor condition. They was in a poor, pathetic way at that point in time. So as before, once again, they started to cry out to God. Once again, they wanted someone to help him. So God sent an unnamed prophet to rebuke the nation. He sent a preacher to him to tell him what the, what the cause was. He said, hey, it's a sin. It's the wickedness in your hearts. The sin is why you're being, that's, that, that, that's why you've fallen under judgment. It's because of your sins. Then at some point, while Gideon was threshing wheat, he was hiding from the Midianites, no doubt, because they were continually coming and raiding their land and taking their harvest, taking their crops, and who knows what else they were taking. I'm sure probably whatever they wanted. So Gideon, he was threshing wheat. He was hiding from the Midianites. We see there, he's, he's not a very courageous man. He's just, he's just sort of a meek man. You know, he, he's trying to just trying to get by at this point in time. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, telling him that he's going to be Israel's next deliverer. No doubt that was a big shock to Gideon. Like I said, he, he was trying to hide from the Midianites. And now an angel of the Lord comes and says, hey, you're going to be my next deliverer. No doubt this wasn't something new to Gideon. He, he knew the history. He knew how they'd been in sin, how they'd been under oppression, and how God had sent them to deliver. So Gideon knew what that would mean. But um, Gideon had doubts. He, he's human. He had doubts. He, he was wondering if, if that was really true. Could he really be a deliverer? He didn't feel like he was adequate enough. So he had doubts. He needed a sign. So the angel of the Lord confirmed Gideon's calling with a sign. And then that prompted Gideon to build an altar unto the Lord. And Gideon named that altar Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord is our peace. And this is where our lesson picks up today. So this was all during the day. The angel of the Lord come and spoke to Gideon during the day. And our lesson picks up right here in verses 25 and 26. It says, and it came to pass the same night 
that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock, and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. Okay, right here, the Lord tells Gideon to take two bullocks. Basically, if you can kind of picture like a team of oxen plowing out in the field, he says, hey, take these two bulls up there and tear that altar down. Use them like a team of oxen. He said, and tear, it's kind of like a bulldozer. I would think in, in our day and time, that'd be kind of like us going to the scene, going to the White House and just taking some bulldozers and just tearing that stuff down. All that wickedness, just tear it down. The Lord said to destroy it. He said, take those two bullets up there and tear it down, destroy it, and tear down that grove that's beside of it. See, the grove, that, that that's a tree or that, that's a, a group of trees that's devoted to to that worship, the worship of the idol is actually like an idol goddess Asherah, which was a female Canaanite god. And the the Asherah or the grove, which is called here in today's lesson, the grove, it was believed to have been like a wooden pole or pillar carved into the likeness of the god. I think of it as kind of like a kind of like a totem pole or some kind of pole, like you'd see in these foreign foreign nations on on the History Channel or something. But it was it was like a pole, and they had graven images on, and they would worship and dance around these poles and stuff. And it was accompanied in, in the in the worship of Baal as well. It, it went along with it. I guess kind of like um, we have song books and singing before the preaching in our day. That was probably the same type of worship they was doing to these idol gods. Um, but um, anyway, it accompanied the Baal worship. So God says, tear it all down. I want rid of all of it. I don't want none of it left. Tear it all down. So, but the real problem was in their heart. Obviously, they were worshiping a false god. They had these totem poles. They had this um, Asherah they're worshiping. But the problem was in their hearts. Their problem was apost apostasy. The problem is unfaithfulness to God. They had left the one true God. They had left their one true God, Jehovah. And that, that's where the main problem started. And then it just escalated from there. But the point is that Gideon, he had to take a stand. He had to choose to take a stand. He was going to stand with the Lord thy God. He was taking a stand for the Lord against Baal and against Asherah. Before he could take a stand as a military leader against the Midianites, he had to take a stand against that false religion, against that idol worship. And still today, it's a must to take a stand. It's a must to have a clean life. You've got to get your life cleaned up through the Lord God. That's the only way you'll have a clean life is through Jesus Christ, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Gideon, he had to get rid of that weakness. He had, to, he had to clean some things up before the Lord could use him to be the military leader, leader that he was going to be to lead the people out of bondage from the Midianites. So still today, we need, we need if we're going to have a real impact on other people, we've got to have our lives in the right place. No one's going to have respect for us if we're out here living wicked and immoral. I think of today's, I think of a lot of the leaders that we have in Washington today. I mean, I'll be honest. I respect the position that they hold, but I do not respect those people. I do not respect the lives that they live. I do not respect the things that they stand for, the immorality. I don't respect the abortions. There's a lot of things that we could go on and on about. I do not respect and I do not support of the people that are leaders in this nation. But I tell you what, if you're going to have a real impact on people in today's time, we're going to have to live for the Lord. That, that's the truth. That's where people, that's where the rubber meets the rose. As Christians, we can't expect to have any credibility among sinners or among the saints when the elements of unrighteousness is in our lives. We can't live wicked one day and then try to live for the Lord the next. People will see that. They'll see a fake. They'll see a phony. You can spot them. You can spot them a mile away. So we need to, we need to have our lives in order. We need to be right with God. But anyway, after, after God ordered Gideon to tear down the altar of Baal, he told him to build an altar unto the Lord thy God. He said, build an altar upon this rock. So he told him to do it according to the order which had been explained to Moses back in Exodus. Everything had to be in order. The stones unhewn in the right place. He said he wanted it done in order. See, God is a God of order. He wants things done in an orderly fashion. He said, put, put, put the altar in order. He said, then offer the second bullock for a sacrifice. Verse 27 says, Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household 
and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Okay, now here we see Gideon's obedience. No doubt, this was not an easy task for Gideon to do. Taking a stand against his father, probably his family, the whole townspeople as well. This takes a lot of great courage. This was a lot of courage that Gideon had before. He didn't even know, he didn't think that he had this kind of courage. But now we see that because he's obedient to God, God has enabled him to have this kind of courage, just as he will you and I. If the Lord asks us to do something, he will enable us with the courage to do it. So no doubt that took great courage. But you know what? We serve a great and a mighty God. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. He has all power. But next I see in, in this verse, I couldn't help but think, well, Gideon, he must have been a good witness for the Lord. He must have had a pretty good, pure and genuine life because we see here that he gets 10 people to go along with him in his fight for truth and right. Now that don't just happen by chance. That's because Gideon no doubt had a life that backed up what his belief was. In verses 28 and 30, it says, and when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, bring out thy son that he may die because he hath cast down the altar of Baal and because he hath cut down the drove that was by it. Here Gideon, he faces opposition. No doubt this was the opposition that he knew he would be facing when the Lord gave him this task to do. So here he faces opposition. Like I said, he, he knew it was going to come. That's why he did it by night because the townspeople would have surely killed him if he went out there in the middle of broad daylight and started tearing down this altar of Baal that they were so that they liked so much, you know, they, they were so into, no doubt they would have went out there and they would, they would have probably laid hands on him and killed him or stoned him. But, uh, but no doubt this must have been a powerful reminder to the people when they woke up the next morning and they seen this altar destroyed and they seen, they seen the smoke still rising. They seen the sacrifice that had been on that altar that Gideon had built for Jehovah God. It must have been a powerful reminder to the people that that altar that was built to Jehovah God their minds must have went back to the days of when, when they used to worship in spirit and truth, when they used to do it the right way. No doubt it, it had to be a reminder to them. So um, they, they seen that and it upset them. They didn't, like, they didn't like that old style of worship. What they liked was they liked worshiping their self. They liked being consumed up in the flesh. They like to worship the flesh and this sex goddess, this Asherah that they would probably no doubt get out there and probably dance around naked and this, that, and the other. That's what they like. That's what the lust of the flesh will do. So they seen Gideon had tore all this down and destroyed it. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill Gideon. But you know what? I think that's still the same reason why people want to kill Christianity today because it goes against the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. But Gideon took a stand against that. God's still looking for some people today that will take a stand for truth and for right. Verses 30 through 32, it says, Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death. While it is yet morning, if he be a God, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore on that day he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Okay, here the people, they went to Joash, which was Gideon's father. They demanded that he turn over his son. Obviously as a parent, you're not going to want to turn your children over to wickedness. You're not going to, want to turn them over to a bunch of people that want to kill them. But here I think we see that there's still some backbone left in Joash. He may have got off on the wrong road, no doubt. He was on the wrong road. He had this altar of bell on his property, this Asherah, these groves. But at least when it comes to his son, I believe his eyes were opened. I said, when it comes to the son, were there something right there? When it comes to the son, the son of God, our eyes should be open. 
But when it came to Joash's son, his eyes were open. He seen that there was a reason still worth taking a taking a stand. There's still a reason worth taking a stand in our day and our time. So instead of turning over his son over that mob, Joash defended Gideon. He said, will you plead for Baal? He said, are you going to take Baal's side? Will you take Baal's side? Will you save him? He said, are you going to rescue Baal? What kind of God is what kind of God is Baal that he needs someone to rescue him? What kind of power does he have? If Baal's really a God, let him take care of himself. That's what Joash tells the people. He says, if he's really a God, let him take care of himself. Let Baal destroy the one who broke his altar apart. Let Baal take care of that guy. Joash knew Baal was no God. I believe in their heart. All the people knew Baal was no God. All Baal was was something that they used to them um, for their flesh, something that they could use to, to kind of give fuel, fuel to the flesh so that they could sin in their own ways and their own lust of the flesh and the lust of their eyes. Baal was no God. He could do nothing. And Joash knew that. He, he couldn't do anything to get him. So Joash said, let the people be put to death that plead for Baal. So he, he takes a stand right here in front of the town's people. He said, he said, if you want to take Baal's side, he said, let, let, let you be put to death. Because I believe Joash, he knew the truth. He just needed someone to take a stand and remind him of it. I believe there's a lot of people today who still know the truth. They've been around the truth. They know the truth. They just need to see someone take a stand. They just need to see someone with a little bit of fire left in them to take a stand. They need to see you. They need to see me taking a stand, taking a stand for truth and right. We see in verse 32 that Joash, he gave Gideon the name Jerubbabel that day, which means let Baal plead against him. It was a slap in the face to Baal and all the Baal worshipers. It was a name that was recognized in defiance to Baal. And how fitting that would be because soon Gideon, with the nickname of Jerubbabel, would defeat the Midianites who worshipped Baal. And his nickname was um, Jerubbabel. Let Baal plead against him. In other words, he, he's mocking Baal. He's saying there's no power in Baal. There's no power in that God. And there's nothing in him. And that was the nickname. That's what Jerubbabel meant. So um, I hope this encourages us all. I know it encouraged me to try to take a bolder stand, to take a stand for Jesus Christ in our day. I think that's what the Lord wants us to do. He's just looking for some people to be obedient. That's why the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. So may we give our time, our talents, may we give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you enjoy this lesson. Thank you.